So I sound good. Are you joining the call yet? So we're uh, we're about ready to start. Uh, we're ready to start now. Let's do it. And um, uh, we uh, will we'll review who all's uh, on the call here in a second. So my name is John MacArthur. I'm Peer Insight moderator here at Wikibon. And uh, today's topic is quieting noisy neighbors in cloud services. It's December 18th, and we're going to discuss how both public and private uh, infrastructure as a service and application as a service uh, and hosting providers can deliver not only availability but performance uh, and, 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 and meet performance service levels in a massively multi tenant environment. Uh, in addition to listening to, to the call, you can watch the call on SiliconANGLE TV. Uh, if you are watching on SiliconANGLE TV, just ask that you uh, uh, that you mute the audio so that we don't uh, so that you don't get uh, a feedback loop. Uh, you can mute your line if you're not speaking. Mute your line with star six or unmute it with star six. So uh, Matt, we don't want you to uh, mute yours because you're going to be speaking here in a second. Um, we are joined today by Matt Wallace. He's the Director of Cloud Infrastructure at Via West. Um, and uh, we may also be joined by uh, Jason Carolyn, uh, CTO at Via West. So with that, um, why don't we kick it off. Uh, Matt, why don't you tell us a little bit about Via West? Uh, as many, of, uh, many of the people probably already know about Via West, but we'd love to get to your uh, quick overview. Sure. Well, VIOS is one of the largest privately held data center providers in the United States. Um, we have big uh, positions in uh, five western states, that being uh, Colorado, Utah, Oregon, Las Vegas, and Texas. Um, we just got the first Uptime Institute Tier 4 uh, design certification uh, for our Lone Mountain facility that's just opening up in uh, the Las Vegas area. and. Um, and of course, more pertinent to today's discussion, we are uh, you know one of the early adopters of uh, SolidFire, um, but uh, we offer uh, essentially cloud co-location and managed services as our our uh, core business. What are um, what are some of the challenges that you um, you face in a in a multi-tenant environment? Well, it's interesting. I mean. Um, when you look at what's going on, and this is in particular in cloud, you know, historically speaking, there's been an enormous uh, amount of technology and development that has gone into making you know, physical hardware multi-tenant over the years. VMware has been around for a lot of time, and the other cloud technologies that are you know, open source based, like uh, you know, Zen and the like. And are, uh, you a VM do you, are you a VMware and Zen user, or do you have both? Or yeah, we do have both. Our cloud offerings are primarily um, VMware focused now, but we also do run some services on Zen using a CA App Logic platform. Okay. Um, but you know, we see VMware is offering a lot more, uh, just in terms of you know, user interface and uh, the tool set and the ecosystem is a, is a lot wider, uh, you know, a lot more robust essentially for our uh, customers to take advantage of. Plus, you know, what we find is. Um, you know, a while back, we actually talked to our customers about, you know, what platform they were interested in using, and we overwhelmingly heard back that our customers were using VMware, and so they were interested in cloud technologies built on VMware because it was compatible with um, the investments that they'd already made and the sort of technological know-how that they already had. So are they, um, are they bridging, you know, internal uh, private cloud to a public cloud or, or to, your, to your infrastructure and your hosting? You know, it varies wildly, um, you know, in terms of uh, what the customers expect. So in some cases, we have customers who, you know, are used to using VMware. They're coming to one of our facilities. We give them the opportunity to, you know, have things in co-location. We do you know, high-speed cross-connects. Uh, one of BioS strengths is that, you know, as a company, we're very used to doing sort of complicated uh, network infrastructure. Um, in a sort of bespoke environment for our customers. So we have a lot of people who take advantage of that by having some co-location space where they might put you know, some of their steady state workload. Maybe they, have, uh, maybe they like having databases on physical servers. Uh, and then they also can take advantage of one of our cloud offerings. So you know, we have both a, 
a cloud offering that's based on vCenter and you know, the vSphere layer for people who need it, uh, that. For you know, some of them want to take advantage of DR capabilities of SRM, which isn't compatible with the cloud layer yet, or um, some of them want to use something like a, a VDI solution that requires vCenter access, um, or we have the cloud layer where we can offer vCloud Director and give people access to uh, you know the full API and user interface that comes along with that and the self-service that comes along with that. But the nice thing is that we can bridge a VLAN uh, between you know, their physical environment and either of our cloud offerings really easily. Okay. Hi, um, hi uh, Matt. This is Dave Vellante. I, I wonder if you could um, respond to the following. There's been a, a lot of talk about cloud washing used as a pejorative, and I w wonder if you could address for our audience what makes you true cloud? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, NIST actually has a you know, definition of cloud. So right. you can go and look up at the, you know, the actual what is a cloud. You know, self-service, uh, you know, scalability, on-demand, pay-as-you-go. You know, there are some characteristics for it. So the nice thing is, you know, this is one of the reasons why you know, we're pretty happy with, uh, you know, the VMware-based cloud offering. If you deploy vCloud Director, you know, fortunately, VMware uh, sort of understands those NIST requirements, and you get a lot of that out of the box. You know, Cloud Director has a, uh, a really fabulous API, uh, all, you know, REST-based uh, XSDs for the entire thing. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I think we've mentioned this, but I mean, I worked at VMware myself uh, for a couple years, so watching different teams kind of scaffold up code to utilize that API, I know that it's, uh, it's very robust. Um, you know, it offers that sort of self-service capability. Why are we a true cloud? I mean, we're, uh, certainly we're allowing this sort of on-demand self-service. Uh, you know, we offer both entirely pay-go, um, where you can just go in and consume huge amounts of cloud resources with no commitment, as well as, you know, what we would call the allocated model, where we can reserve a certain chunk of use, uh, of utilization for you. But every customer we onboard has the ability to burst, um, you know, between two and a half and three x of their committed rate, so that uh, that agility is built into our offering. Uh, you know, part of what we do is, you know, we we essentially our entire architecture is um, built around over provisioning hardware to a certain extent to make sure that our customers do have that room to burst, so they get that uh, real cloud experience. Um, you know, given that it's all self-service and you have a portal and you have full unfettered access to all those APIs, I don't know what term you could use to describe it um, other than a cloud. So Great. Um, uh, certainly, I'm, I'm definitely familiar with the cloud washing term, though. Uh, <laughs> all right, so you wouldn't but, put yourselves in that camp. Huh? <laughs> so No, I mean, for sure, I think that our, our uh, cloud offering, our connected cloud offering is for sure a real cloud. It satisfies every one of those uh, criteria, basically. Now, what's interesting is I think when you look at, you know, this space for really ancillary products, when you start looking at it, um, there are a whole lot of things that you can offer that may not necessarily be fully integrated and in, in offer that cloud experience. So here's a great example. I mean, if we offer, and, and this is actually, we do offer this, but we offer Avamar backups that can work um, against, um, you know, our, our cloud VMs. So you can take advantage of having all of your uh, virtual machines backed up, you know, at a file level. Uh, but it's not something with the, the current offering right at the current version where you can just go turn it on. Now, does that mean that's not a cloud service because we have to turn it on for you? I mean, you could argue that, I think, either way. Clearly, the service that's working against the cloud service, but the backup service itself, you might say, is not cloudy because it's not entirely self-service. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Um, the, the, my follow-up question is, you know, Amazon's obviously being very aggressive with its entrance into the enterprise with a horizontal you know, commodity like service. And so we're seeing service providers really needing to have a very clear value proposition for enterprise customers and focus on a set of services uh, and maybe even a set of customers around which you're providing solutions. Can you talk about your differentiation in the face of this Amazon trend and, the, and just the commoditization of infrastructure as a service? Sure, well, I mean, I, I think maybe, if, you know, what you were interested in doing was taking advantage of, you know, commodity compute because that's what you needed, um, you know, I can see where Amazon and their price competitiveness and their, you know, uh, you know their scale is, can be, could be interesting to some people, but you know, there are so many things that I've heard as, as feedback, basically, that are shortcomings at Amazon. 
Uh, we've had a lot of people who've run into inabilities to scale their architecture um, because they run into problems with Amazon's networking. Um, you know, to the best of my knowledge, most of their infrastructure outside of the HPC instances is connected on one gig, whereas you know all of our stuff is based on UCS. All of our networking is multiple 10 gigs um, in either channels, so the scalability of our network is much higher. Um, whereas you have no idea what sort of platform they're on. You know, we've chosen to build our cloud on what we consider the best of breed of enterprise hardware. So we have the sort of performance and reliability of you know, UCS behind our cloud. Um, you know, with Amazon, we've had uh, instances where people have asked about it and, you know, tried to do a direct comparison. And, you know, one of the first things that the conversation turns towards when we talk about us versus Amazon is just the fact that if you're even interested in getting any sort of support from them, too, you, you better start adding on the upcharges for support. You know, our customers are used to an experience where um, they can pick up the phone and call us, and I mean, we have some incredibly talented, um, you know, really bright engineers, uh, you know, who they spend a lot of their day actually doing you know, development work uh, for us, and yet these are the cloud engineers that you can talk to if you have an issue on our cloud. Whereas, you know, if you ask people what sort of customer uh, service experience they receive at Amazon if they run into trouble, you know, I think that the what you probably end up hearing is they tell you a tale about. Uh, you know, what sort of experience they had going to the Amazon forums and asking the community for help. So you know, if you want somebody who can actually stand behind what they're providing and, and help you out, I think um, you know, there's a clear value that we're delivering for people who, you know, um, they want to be able to use the infrastructure, but they want you to be responsible for it and, and not just have to figure out all the ins and outs themselves. Yeah. Plus, of course, yeah. we have a whole suite of managed services. So, you know, one of the things you're – you're going to go looking to Amazon. If you were there, you'd have to look to partners to provide you with things like managed operating systems, managed databases, and things like that. Um, whereas, you know, we've had a huge adoption of those in our other environments, like co-location and dedicated servers. And of course, the fact that we can offer the same thing on the cloud is really attractive to people who, you know, want to don't want to manage that because it's not their core business. You talked a little bit about over provisioning. You also talked about um, talked about database applications and. You know, customers still wanting to run them in um, on dedicated servers. Uh, is, is, are any of the technology changes that are occurring in your environment enabling you to deliver a different kind of offering, and uh, uh, with the burstiness and that might come from from those applications, and also the latency requirements that might come from those applications? Sure. Well, you know, latency hasn't been a big issue because, you know, we're really, we, you know, we don't have to worry about, I think I mentioned this before, but, you know, the fact that we're using, uh, you know, multiple 10 gig links, that we're using, you know, high performance, uh, you know, Cisco and Arista gear to do all of our, uh, you know, switching, uh, not stretching things over wide distances means that our latency is, you know, tends to be incredibly low. Um, you know, even the cross-connecting we do for customers is done pretty efficiently and it results in a minimum number of physical hops. So you know, if you're connecting to a service that's in the same data center that you're in, you know, we offer things like cloud services in multiple data centers. Uh, you have the ability to, to reach that you know, really quickly. Um, you know, the, the question about database, though, is a great one. And I mean, it's a great segue into talking about, you know, really where SolidFire fits in and how this got to be so exciting uh, when I first saw it. So I mean, Coming from VMware, I'm used to that sort of memory and CPU being really well managed at the hypervisor layer. And obviously, you know, over this decade, we've seen the hardware support for virtualization has really improved uh, with Intel and AMD coming on board to, uh, you know, virtualize the memory management and the CPU uh, context switching. Now, looking at, you know, storage, though, historically, this has always been a, a really risky proposition if you were on shared storage because you know, there's, there hasn't been a lot of good tools for controlling how much performance and how much I.O. any individual tenant gets out of a shared array. And of course, if you're in the cloud and you've got, you know, everybody wants to use the uh, you know, volumes that can move from virtual machine to virtual machine. You don't want local disk tied to local hardware because it's really the antithesis of doing things the cloud way. You want to be on shared storage for the advantages, but you don't want the disadvantages, the noisy neighbors that potentially come with that. So, you know, when I was talking about database servers, this is the way some people, you know, deal with having, uh, you know, consistent performance for things that need it and being able to scale horizontally for things that scale more easily horizontally. The issue with databases traditionally is that they don't scale well uh, horizontally. You end up having to scale them vertically and just pour more RAM and CPU into them and, of course, more disk I.O. performance. So, 
what we're going, you know, where we're going with the software offering is this ability now to have these network accessible volumes that people can attach to database servers, including virtual database servers, that allow them to get guaranteed performance for those applications. So you can actually run a database server and be assured that you're going to get a consistent performance and, and high performance that you need for that application. And now you don't need two environments, you can have just one. And how do you measure performance? What, 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 are, what are the metrics? Well, I mean, so the big ones, I guess, would be latency, um, you know, for an individual write, and then, uh, you know, throughput basically is measured in terms of IOPS. Right. And so what kind of latency requirements are you seeing from your customers? Well, that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, if you're looking at network accessible volumes, you know, the, the best you're probably going to get, and I don't think we want to deep dive too far into, you know, queuing theory here, but I think if we're getting sure we under <laughs> 0.2 milliseconds, we're doing a pretty reasonable job uh -huh. as to being able to, you know, network-wise, which can result in a, you know, uh, somewhere between a 400 and a 700 microsecond uh, sync time on an individual write. Now, that's not what you get from a single disk, but now we're talking about a, a SAN array where you're doing a write and it's actually being committed to more than one drive or at least more than one write back cache before it gets returned. So, you know, that's an, really an amazing performance. And if you do the math basically and divide that out, even in the sort of worst case scenario on the upper bound that I'm talking about in the 600 to 700 microsecond range, even on a single thread, even waiting for a sync after every single write, you can actually get about 1,500 IOPS that way. And that's, you know, essentially your worst case scenario with just one thread writing entirely, entirely serially. And of course, you know, your typical database is not going to be limited that way because different tables are being accessed at different times. And so you'll be able to actually use multiple threads to do multiple writes uh, to different parts of the disk. So you, so you can so you can handle more multi-tenancy. You can handle more um, burstiness in the in the in the write activity. Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, we're talking about if you're if you're able to actually handle, you know, if your application basically can do multiple threads, um, you know, then what the hardware platform supports is up to about fifteen thousand IOPS on a single volume. Okay. Um, why don't we uh, pause for a second in our questions and see if there are any questions in the community. Um, so, to, again, if you've muted your line, press star six to unmute it and, uh, and just uh, jump in with questions. Uh, this, is, this is David Sawyer. Um, I, I've got a question on the uh, latency, et cetera. There's, uh, one is the average latency, which is important. Um, the other is the maximum latencies. And if you get a significant number, you know, over 8 milliseconds or over 50 milliseconds, then you start to get uh, uh, some pr pretty bad effects. In fact, uh, Aerospike published a, um, a, uh, a, a benchmark for database type uh, applications. And that's one of their main conclusions was that it was important to avoid those uh, high spikes. Um, any comments on what you're getting? Uh, with uh, with your setup now, yeah, I mean, our yeah, it, that's a great point, and I mean, you know, this ultimately is one of those funny things that, that can separate a you know sort of synthetic benchmark from uh, you know real world performance. I mean, a lot of drives, um, you know, or arrays are going to get you know really great performance for very short term tests because they have you know caches that are essentially DRAM that can fill up and. As long as you're piling, you know, data into DIMMs, you're going to get incredible performance and incredible, you know, your, your write latency is super minimal. And once you, you know, put on a continuous load that exceeds what the drives behind the scene can actually do in terms of writing the disk, you know, your performance is going to completely crash. Um, and if, if you just start to bump up against that, of course, you know, there's going to be essentially a pushback because there's a sort of throttling effect as things don't get written as quickly. And then applications see this sort of... Uh, spiky performance where they're actually waiting for a, a disk write or at least, you know, space to uh, open up in the um, cache. Uh, you know, this is the nice thing about having to it's entirely backed by SSD uh, because although the you know, solid fire appliances have 8 gig, um, you know, DRAM write caches on them, you don't have, you don't run the same risk basically of uh, filling those up because the entire, you know, array behind is, um, is built on SSD. And, you know, because of the way they distribute blocks across all of the drives, 
um, in the entire array, this kind of amazing horizontal scalability um, where they can take advantage you know, of ever-increasing number of nodes um, you know, to increase their write performance. Um, you know, we just don't see that sort of performance spike. Um, you know, it's interesting. We've only gotten really uh, recently into testing, you know, all the fine grain stuff. Um, I, I see basically a maximum variation so far in testing of about three to four milliseconds um, as the, the slowest write, and that tends to be on long runs. You know, we see that around the 99.9 to 99.5, you know, 99.5th percentile goes as high as maybe four milliseconds, whereas obviously, like I said, what we're looking to see typically is the 400 to 700 microsecond range, which is what I see, you know, at the 50 and 75 and 90 percent uh, marks. So it would be wonderful if we could get uh, get all the way down, you know, where all the rights, you know, all the way up to 99.99th percentile, um, we're consistently in that 400 to 700 microsecond range. Uh, you know, barring obviously if you know drive fails or something like that, then we we're, we're going to expect to see a you know the, a couple milliseconds of creep there while it uh, adjusts. But you know, other than that, I'd like to see fully consistent performance, but uh, certainly nothing anywhere near the 50 millisecond range so far. Excellent, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions in the community? Just want to. Um, so behind this behind the uh, SSD uh, what else what else are you using for storage infrastructure today well you know we have a, a bunch of uh, traditional you know offerings uh, from uh, ranging from uh, EMC VNXs which we've actually run uh, for customers as, as dedicated arrays because you know I didn't mention this earlier but this is another one of those answers to you know, what happens if you need that consistent performance? You know, one of the options before was getting an array all to yourself. Um, you know, we also have uh, all of our sort of base cloud storage is based on uh, NetApp. And uh, you know, we also have uh, a SAN offering from 3PAR in a, several locations. Uh, so we actually have a, a wide variety of storage solutions we've utilized for several workloads. but. Obviously, it's a little bit different from being able to offer the sort of, uh, you know, guaranteed IOPS, guaranteed performance, uh, you know, storage that we can offer now. So, so when you when you need to deliver guaranteed IOPS, you'll go with a with a solid fire infrastructure. And when it's, uh, how do you how are you making those decisions? Is where to deploy which technology? Well, obviously, you know, it's ultimately up to the customer to try to you know, figure out what makes sense for them, uh, you know, in terms of the offerings, but. If someone were to say to us, you know, I need absolutely guaranteed performance, you know, there's only really two choices that we can offer. You know, one is something that's entirely dedicated to them, uh, and obviously, if we're building out sort of entirely private infrastructure as opposed to cloud infrastructure, you know, we can turn to local disks uh, to offer that. Although, of course, there are downsides, um, you know, to having data stranded on uh, nodes that could theoretically be down. Um, the other choice is that dedicated array. And then, you know, SolidFire obviously gives us that sort of the flexibility and, and power and sort of agility of that sort of traditional network attached storage, but with the guaranteed performance that goes with, you know, traditionally with those other options. So I'm an old procurement guy, and, you know, I always care about quality and service and things like that, but I also care about price. So if they go with, um, if, they, if they go with a shared infrastructure that's based on the, on the, uh, Solution from SolidFire versus a dedicated disk from one of the other. Are, are they going to see a substantial uh, cost savings? Well, it, they, it's certainly possible. I would say that they see a substantial cost savings. It's not a. It, this isn't a price negotiation, is it? but I just you know. Yeah, no. I mean, I, I I guess my point is really that you know everybody's requirements are different. So I mean, to, to name an, an example that came up recently, where I had a discussion with one of our sales engineers about the particular need of a customer. You know, they had a need for uh, only two terabytes of storage, but they needed 7,000 IOPS out of it for their application. So, okay. you know, when we began, you're looking at what our guidance is for, you know, the number of terabytes that you'd need in terms of NAS or SAN for that level of performance, you know, you suddenly realize that they're going to have to probably over-provision storage, you know, by some huge multiple, maybe 10x or so, in order to get you know, sort of IOPS that they'd need for that. So when you start comparing that to, you know, what you can get from 
Saul's fire, it comes really, and that's obviously a really dramatic example, but it comes, becomes really obvious that uh, the Saul's fire is really advantageous at that point. How sophisticated have you gotten at this point in being able to have some automation to your own decision-making process on the, on, you know, what infrastructure to use for what, which use case, if you've got that much variability in the customer use cases? Right, that's a good question. You know, honestly, at this point, the, the decision about what sort of platform to use is something that we have to push sort of to the front of the process. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of, obviously, if we have somebody who's on a storage platform that is auto-tiering, you know, they get to take advantage of that. But, uh, you know, we, we don't have, I wouldn't say, too many tools, basically, to sort of automatically direct someone to the right uh, the right platform. Of course, you know, when we start talking about cloud, uh, you know, we're in the process right now of doing our upgrade to Cloud Director 5.1, which uh, brings with it the ability to do storage tiers. So, you know, going forward, um, as we roll that out, customers on that cloud will be able to actually you know, pick and choose what storage tier suits them best, uh, because it supports basically choosing something like NAS, SAN, or SSC back, uh, storage as you deploy a VM, you sort of choose what type makes sense, and we just sort of fill as you go. Hmm. Uh, this is uh, David again. Um, I, I've got a question on uh, the total no number of IOPS and the total amount of uh, capacity on the uh, solid fire. Um, which which do you, are you running out of uh, first? So how, how do you balance those two in a practical sense of uh, selling them? Do, do you separate those uh, two components out? Right. So, I mean, it's, I think it's important to say that, you know, kind of quote unquote running out is a, maybe a bad term to use for us because, you know, we're pretty early right now in the deployment of this. So, uh, you know, we're not anywhere near saturating either of those uh, with production workloads on our side. So, it's, it's difficult to say, uh, you know, in the early phase what's going to see a uh, you know, bigger adoption. I will say that, you know, since people are sort of used to traditionally, you know, sizing their workloads for, you know, what they sort of expect in terms of performance to disk ratios in, in with sort of traditional non-SSD disk, uh, my perception is that there will be a larger demand for the number of, you know, terabytes or gigabytes available on the disk than there will be for the I.O. In other words, I think for the typical, you know, uh, sort of consumer of this product, uh, there's a there's essentially more IOPS than they'll need. Um, although, you know, it, it's odd in a sense, of course, because you know, to me the huge advantage of SolidFire as a platform isn't really just the fact that it's fast, because there are a lot of SSD vendors who have offered, you know, fast offerings. Uh, you know, there's the, the whip tails and the pure storages of the world, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that as the, for, if it fits your use case. But to me, the killer application is definitely the the guaranteed I.O. The, the quality of service features is really what makes it fit in the multi-tenant environment, really makes it a solution enabler in the multi-tenant environment. Um, but yeah, I think to get back to the base question, I would say, you know, my, my feeling so far, even though we don't have enough data, I think to draw a, a solid, you know, uh, end stage conclusion is that uh, in terms of capacity versus performance, there's definitely more available performance. Uh, on the other hand, you know, as we start to onboard customers who get a feel for, wow, I really can have a, you know, 500 gigabyte volume that can get 12,000 IOPS, um, you know, we may see their sort of, their, uh, the way that they provision their storage actually change as they, they see that the power of the solution offers. Hey, I wonder, Matt, if we could go through sort of the customer pro decision process to actually move apps, uh, tier one apps, into the cloud and, and on a, 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 a disk, a, a flash-based disk, and maybe they don't even have necessarily high visibility on that, maybe they don't care where it goes, but can you talk about that whole customer decision process? How do they get there? Where are they coming from? What ultimately you know, gets them to make that decision? What's the business case? Well, I'll tell you, you know, first of all, I should preface this by saying that you know, since I don't spend too much time you know, out of the field doing sales engineering work, you're, you're kind of getting a second-hand answer. Uh, but my impression so far is that you know, the customers who are performance sensitive, they they come uh, sort of with an IOPS requirement in hand, or or they have an existing array that can be extrapolated. So they might say, well, we're using this type of array that has this sort of cache, 
that has uh, this many drives of this type. You know, so they go, you know, this this thing has 16 gigs of write cache, and then behind the scene, it's got you know 12 uh, 15k SAS drives. You know, uh, it seems like we're maxing it out. What sort of performance are we going to need if we move to this platform? And so, obviously, at that point, we can engage one of our uh, storage engineers to you know. Uh, basically come up with sort of some sort of estimates based on their existing environment. Other customers are a lot more savvy and they've actually benchmarked their environment and they have a good feeling for what they're actually consuming. So I mean like the example I brought earlier, you know, somebody knew that they needed two terabytes of space, they knew that they needed seven thousand IOPS because they measured it. You know, they felt like having a little bit of uh, upside in terms of, you know, the ability to burst would be great, but you know, they expected their performance requirements to remain relatively steady state. Um, and so in that case, it's, it's them coming to us saying, this is what I need. What sort of solution can you offer to fit that? So, Okay. Um, so what, uh, as somebody with a technical background, what's your opinion on sort of the future of traditional block-based storage? Um, maybe you could summarize what you see happening there. I mean, there's got to be trade-offs when you're moving to a new architecture. Um, <clears throat> you may be missing some components of the... The, the data stack, maybe not, I don't know, uh, in terms of maturity possibly. So as a technical person, what goes through your mind to, to sort of stink test the, the new platforms, if you will? Well, it's, it's funny you should mention that. I mean, we went through a you know, months-long process, basically, where we abused the solid fire appliances. Uh, and obviously, you know, what you're mentioning is, is probably the scariest thing about adopting any new platform. So, you know, in the in the vein of that, you know, aphorism, no one ever got fired for buying Microsoft, obviously people feel really comfortable with the sort of entrenched and traditional storage vendors. Um, you know, and they have enormous, enormously long and good reliability records. You know, they have uh, mature um, service and support. And so, you know, people feel comfortable with them for a reason. Uh, I've never had a reason to complain about those you know, sort of service from EMC or NetApp on arrays like that. Um, you know, so when it comes to a, a company that's sort of the, the upstart, the fresh uh, company like Solidfire, certainly, um, you know, we we felt the need, like we would never feel with a, an EMC or a NetApp to really put it through its paces. So we spent a lot of time, you know, pulling out drives, pulling out cables, disconnecting switches, uh, you know, deleting and restoring volumes rapidly, you know, provisioning hundreds of customers in the, the matter of, you know, a window of, of minutes. Uh, just to kind of see where the rough edges were, if there were any, and uh, you know that's a lot of work, I guess that I don't think we would have had to uh, to do if we were on a sort of mature platform. Uh, but you know, some, sometimes you know this is the interesting case. Sometimes you run into a scenario where a technology is exciting enough and, and solves a big enough uh, problem that you know it's worth going through that extra effort. All right. Thank you. Um, you know, in terms of where storage is going, it's interesting because, you know, one of the things I, I'm, I'm fond of talking about where cloud was because there's this enormous, there are so many neat advantages you get from using cloud services. The ability to, you know, scale on demand and that business agility, uh, the ability to avoid CapEx um, and, and, you know, reduce your spend to an OpEx number or get away from running your own hardware. Um, you know, when we start talking about, you know, customers that in the past have had to opt for a dedicated array solution, now we're essentially talking about somebody who had to go the CapEx route, you know, although we can offer that sort of as a service and do that capitalization for them. But even if we do that, even if we, you know, sort of spread out the, the uh, purchasing and operating of, say, a dedicated VNX over a whole lot of months for them, you know, they're still in this scenario where they've picked a specific piece of hardware. And uh, you know, let's say they have a buyout or a merger, or uh, they get featured on, you know, Oprah, and they're a huge hit, and they need to grow rapidly. They're looking at a scenario where uh, they don't have the ability necessarily to scale their platform up on demand. They don't necessarily have the ability to grow overnight and then uh, sort of get rid of that excess capacity if it's only a temporary need. Whereas you look at what's going on with you know, what Solify enables, and it essentially enables the same business agility that we've kind of come to almost take for granted on the, the compute and memory side with cloud, and it provides that same sort of ability to scale up on demand really rapidly uh, on that shared storage platform. I mean, shared storage as a as a platform in general has a lot of those really great you know cloud attributes: the agility, the scalability, the lack of capex, but you know, with the noisy neighbor problem being the downside, it was a real trade-off. So I think um, 
you know, with the guaranteed QoS, now we're talking about having those same advantages of the shared platform, but with the uh, without the downsides. I think when you know, so I remember back to the early days of storage as a service and early migrations to what's not now called cloud offerings. But there was an awful lot of dedicated infrastructure. Um, you could scale up, but you couldn't necessarily scale down because the cloud providers or the storage as a service providers were, were you know, they had to make big investments and they needed to capitalize that. They need to, they need something to to write off ag uh, against those. So. What has what's fundamentally changed to that to to make that uh, to, to to make it possible to be able to both scale up and down, um, and not just not just uh, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I mean, obviously, it helps to to not be in a steady state. You know, if you always have a, a certain amount of country, uh, customer interest and you have a certain fill rate that you're expecting and that is playing out. Then, if you have one particular customer that says, "Oh, I need more, and now I don't need as much," it's the same as cloud. Um, you know, obviously, when you go out and you spin up virtual machines in a sort of on-demand basis, you're essentially paying, you know, to use some capacity that isn't necessarily always going to be utilized. In the same way, um, I think that applies to the storage array. You know, you're using some capacity if you burst up that's not always being utilized, but you know, if you're talking about a customer that you know, spins up and then spins back down, there's not really a huge concern about the fact that they're spinning back down because there are other customers basically just in the ordinary course of business who are going to come along, who are going to be interested in that solution, who will be, you know, more than happy to pick up the capacity. Um, the, the, other push, the other pushback on cloud offerings has been that, you know, at relatively small and sort of bursty stuff, it made sense, but once you get to a certain scale, it, it gets harder to justify the overhead uh, associated with the cloud provider starts to um, swamp what I can do internally. Are you seeing that, or is that changing as well? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think possibly since our you know cloud offerings have only really been you know, in the field now for around a year and a half. I don't know that we've you know seen the entire life cycle of customers, uh, but. You have to keep in mind that unlike a lot of cloud providers, you know, Via West is you know, a provider who offers the whole gamut of services. So, I mean, the fact that we actually have co-location environments, the fact that we can actually run managed dedicated servers for people uh, for whom that makes sense, and that's, I mean, been you know, Via West's core business in the pre-cloud era um, for a long time, means that, you know, unlike a, a, a scenario with a pure cloud player, uh, you know, we can actually sort of have a conversation with our customers about you know the options that are available to them and the economics because we can actually you know, service a whole uh, you know a whole gamut of needs that they might have. So uh, you know if we had somebody who decided for some reason that they actually wanted to go back to the business of capitalizing the infrastructure themselves uh, that they wanted to you know have a hardware that was dedicated and, and have space, you know we're we're still there. We can still be their data center provider and obviously we're you know, with that being that first ever tier four design certified uh, data center, you know, we're kind of on the cutting edge of data center technology as well. So uh, I think we, we kind of have a lot to offer that way. I guess we, we're not necessarily in the same place as some cloud providers where if a customer decides the cloud isn't really suiting their workload, they, they lose them as a customer. So we can actually, you know, serve a wider variety of needs. Um, Matt, Matt I, I wonder if I could ask you about the whole converged infrastructure trend. You've seen a, virtually every major server and storage vendor is playing in, in that sandbox these days. Um, what is your um, perception of that? Are you guys take, trying to take advantage of that? And, and if not, why not? And if so, how does the, the solid fire uh, uh, you know, partnership play into that? Because essentially it feels like a bespoke piece of infrastructure. I wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah, well, I mean, could the converged infrastructure trend, and I mean, you know, obviously, I, I think I mentioned this as we did the round of introductions. You know, we standardized on UCS as a platform for our, uh, our cloud-related offerings. And one of the reasons why it's so attractive is the fact that, you know, if you looked at the more traditional environments where we had to actually deploy a whole stack of hardware for someone in order to, you know, deal with their compute needs, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of expense, you know, in, in uh, maintaining a whole network of, say, brocades to give people SAN access or you know, switches to do cross-connects to a backup network and so on and so forth. 
uh, but all the fiber runs and all of the port charges, uh, you know, the sorts of things that you end up having to build into your products uh, can actually be relatively expensive. Uh, to say nothing of the fact that you know it, it's a little tricky to deal with you know, scaling everybody's hardware individually and the fact that you know that leads to a certain sprawl and operational complexity in terms of having more platforms to maintain, you know, more firmware updates to test, and so on and so forth. Um, so the, the, to me, the primary the primary benefit of that converged infrastructure is really about being able to have this uh, seamless blend between the compute and the network uh, that allows you to avoid a lot of those extra cross connects and uh, and so on and so forth, and kind of use that shared infrastructure scale that shared infrastructure. I think that trend probably continues um, as you know we see a bigger adoption of virtual appliances. So obviously, you know, vCloud comes with vShield appliances that do uh, firewalling and load balancing. We also have uh, A10 that we're used to running in physical environments. We're rolling out a, uh, a software load balancer for that. Uh, and then of course, you know, you've got companies that we don't necessarily offer but are also big in this space like Viata, you know, just got acquired big in the uh, virtual firewall space. I think with the converse, with the sort of move to those software appliances uh, as well, you have some more ability to take advantage of those with the converged infrastructure. So it's, it sounds like you're two-thirds converged, the, the systems and the, and the network, but you've left the flexibility in the storage piece. So you just sort of essentially build your own converged infrastructure by by slotting in the the storage piece is that is that correct to your own standards or am i am, am i off base well, the, the nice part about this is i mean again going back to that converged infrastructure is we can get away from having to worry about individual cross connects onto you know storage networks uh, so we had a you know we had a sand network for storage in place prior to um, our deployment of ucs but let's say you come to us today and you want to get you know a certain amount of compute one of the nice things about having a converged infrastructure is you're sort of having the, you know, the, once you're on to something like UCS, we don't actually need to charge you port charges to connect to brocades and so on and so forth to get access to the SAN because all of it, it's all, you know, pre-connected effectively. So no, I mean, it, it, I wouldn't say that you necessarily need to, to pick a specific pre can component. Just the fact that you can tie all of your storage infrastructure into this one compute platform and let people, you know, connect all to it through, uh, you know, it, obviously in a UCS case, it's the fabric interconnects and the fabric extenders. The fact that people can just connect to that and get access to all of your services through that one layer uh, really sort of reduces the overall cost of the solution. And um, my other question was, um, you know, this is saying that people don't buy from startups because they want to, they buy from startups because they have to. Um, and so startups have to be considerably better than you know the status quo, so uh, I wonder if y you could comment on that. Uh, number one and number two. I mean, there's there's other guys out there with all flash arrays in the wings. Uh, you know, certainly EMC made an acquisition, uh, uh, and there are others. So, I wonder if you could t uh, comment on that, and then sort of circle back to why Solid Fire. Sure. Well, I mean, I, I mentioned this before because I, you know, I've actually uh, I've talked to a lot of. Um, a lot of people that are offering, uh, you know, pure SSD arrays. So, you know, among them I mentioned Whiptail and uh, Pure Storage. You know, and it's not that they don't have. I'm not going to say that they don't have a place in the world. But what they're, what everyone has lacked that you know, is to me is the really exciting thing about Solid Fire is the fact that they're missing that QoS piece. Um, you know, obviously we put in place a, an SSD array as opposed to a traditional array specifically because we're looking to you know solve the noisy neighbor problem. The issue with out quality of service is you're essentially trading a smaller noisy neighbor problem for uh, just a, a noisy neighbor that's harder to reach. So, you know, it's, you're essentially increasing the capacity, but still, if you have a noisy enough neighbor, they can still consume all of those resources uh, without that sort of quality of service layer. With the solid fire, you know, the, the differentiator for us is actually that we can have many small tenants and uh, they can be, you know, Somebody who wanted a 500 or 700 IOPS, which actually, even in terms of traditional drives, that's quite a lot of performance. But maybe they put that with 500 gigs um, of you know, storage or even 100 gig volume. They can get that sort of guarantee and not actually be worried that the sort of huge uh, players on the, the array that are consuming lots and lots of terabytes and lots and lots of IOPS, you know, potentially tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of IOPS, 
are going to totally crowd them out when their workload bursts. You know, our philosophy with the solid fire appliance is to never over provision the guaranteed amounts of, uh, of performance. So, uh, you know, if people want to use essentially uh, what the burst capacity that's available, you know, we'll make that available to them. But we will always make it on our offering so that the minimums are always kept. So even if everybody basically is using 100% of their minimum, that'll still be within the, uh, the array's performance to deliver. So it would it, it would seem like the quality of service requirements in SSD would also apply to you know, hybrid arrays that you might deploy or 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 or, or just regular spinning disk um, arrays that you you might deploy. Is there a, 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 an application of that sort of a philosophy to the other array types? I have yet to see any vendor that is uh, is able to offer that sort of quality of service guarantee on any other type of array. But if they could, if they could, would you want it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, the very first time I met SolidFire, I said, uh, can you apply this software to traditional spinning disk, please? Yeah. <laughs> but you know, To which they I said think, what? To which they said what? <laughs> uh, I, I think they said, mm, we're, we're kind of busy with uh, what we're working okay. on right now. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, this, this is, uh, David, I mean, I just make a comment on that. It, it's pretty impossible to do that because of the thin pipe you have to each of the disks. Um, it it it's, would be extremely difficult to architect that in a, a and, and, and has been to architect that in a disk environment. Um, that was actually the comment I was going to make, too, is just the fact that, you know, with traditional disk, you know, the spinning disks, you don't even necessarily know what you're going to get necessarily in terms of performance because... You know, any given write or read is going to be it's going to be located on different sectors. You know, you you can't predict the amount of time it's going to take. You know, the the seek time is going to vary from read to read, and you know, so you're in in the sort of uh, grand scheme of things. I just don't see how you can get the sort of consistent performance that you get out of an SSD. Yeah, can I ask a question about the SLAs you can offer and and the type of uh, customer you can uh, 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 get? within your organization, um, within your service. It, it seems to me that if you have that level of, uh, of I.O. capability, then it takes away a, a huge uh, disincentive to virtualize from database in general. Is that what you're can you Can you offer that? Can you sort of guarantee performance in a virtualized environment? And does that allow you to specialize? And, and what kind of SLAs can you offer with this capability? So our SLAs are going to be specifically oriented around uh, you know, the number of IOPS we can provide. Uh, you know, and that's obviously assuming that you know clients are using it in such a way to consume all of it. So I mean, again, this is one of those things where you know we talked before a little bit about queuing theory and about uh, you know the, the fact that depending on the application, there's just no way with you know round trip times on a network, no matter how fast it is, there's a limit to how fast you can you know sync something to disk and and return a response. So if somebody had a single threaded application where every time they sent a write to the array, they had to wait for it to come back before they could send another write, you know, there's no point in selling them a quality of service level of 10,000 IOPS because they'll never be able to take advantage of that because it would require a, you know, a 100 microsecond full round trip time, which just isn't realistic uh, on any sort of you know network attached storage. Um, but, um, you know, database is, I, I think, probably, I almost want to call it the killer application for this. Um, you know, database technology is basically ubiquitous in terms of what applications, you know, really sort of expect in the real world. Uh, it's one of those things that people have been really low to put on to, uh, you know, any sort of cloud service. You know, cloud services try to use traditional databases in cloud environments that tend to not, you know, end well. And, of course, you know, Amazon plays a trail here in terms of, you uh, uh, developing a sort of bad reputation with that use case, and it's been giving rise to a whole, you know, alternative array of technologies. You know, the whole uh, NoSQL distributed, uh, you know, distributed big data type of, um, you know, applications basically are, are all I think designed to get around the issue and, and provide you that sort of database layer, but you know, entirely horizontally scalable, so you're not at risk from any sort of one node causing a problem. You know, with SolidFire, I definitely see that, you know, the environment of, you know, VMware-backed uh, compute and memory on the UCS platform with the high-speed networking that we deploy, 
with the solid fire disc backing it, you know, I see that as, as getting basically parity with a dedicated physical platform. There's just not really bottlenecks here because we're now talking about uh, every component of this of this uh, infrastructure is essentially being um, hardware rationed in a sense that you know you can't actually run into the scenarios where the performance isn't available unless your provider uh, over provisions, which we just don't. I, I want to uh, give one last chance to our. Uh to our listeners to see if there are any other questions in the community before we wrap. Any other questions? Okay, David, any last questions from you before we wrap? Well, the, the, the last question I had was that um, in terms of uh, SLAs, uh, uh, this level of control, does that allow you to give SLAs that uh, are more flexible in, in terms of uh, allowing bursts, for example, or being able to um, uh, allow them to go over limits at a certain time? Uh, things like that, which you, you just can't do in a traditional environment. It seems to me uh, you've got a lot of flexibility there. Yeah, I mean, I think with, when you look at SLAs around this traditional environment, you know, everybody makes best efforts, but your your SLAs around a traditional storage platform really come down to, is it is the platform available? Uh, whereas, obviously, with SolidFire, the granularity is, is you know, is, I mean, it's hard to describe because there's really nothing like it. There has not been an, an offering that allows you to deliver, you know, an SLA around quality of service this way. Um, I think I was going to comment earlier that, you know, when you're when you're talking about how you control basically more traditional environments, there's never been a quality of service that actually put you a number, uh, let you put a number on it. So you could get to the point where, you know, with some of the quality of service offerings around disk, you could do a certain shares offering where everybody who is you know attacking it has got a certain share of performance, but it was really no guarantee that any you know, given tenant was going to get any specific performance number. So you know, with SolidFire, we're actually able to say you will get this number of IOPS that will be available to you on your volume, and we can guarantee that it will always be available to you. So we can actually put a number and say, you have a terabyte, it comes with 10,000 IOPS, you will always have those 10,000 IOPS, and that's just the SLA that we're offering around it. You know, obviously the tenant has to be able to take advantage of that. Again, there's that whole, you know, round trip and, and so on and so forth. But you know, actually being able to say specifically, we can guarantee you this number of IOPS, to me that's the sort of, uh, that's the sort of killer app. That's the SLA that people need to be able to feel comfortable putting a database in the cloud. Um, now there's no, this, you know, we're backing this same, you know, uh, guarantees that, you know, we would put on a, a platform like a compute or something along like those lines that's been, you know, traditionally more regulated. In terms of, you know, the maximum in burst, um, you know, we actually, yes, we can offer, uh, you know, increases. So SolidFire, you know, lets you actually tune uh, volume so that there's a minimum uh, and then there's a maximum which you just can't go above it'll use quality you know so if you were to set someone to a thousand minimum IOPS to two thousand maximum IOPS even if this array has available performance it'll throttle them around the two thousand mark but it also has a burst capability as well where essentially people are using underneath their uh, sort of assigned quality of service level in terms of IOPS, they sort of earn this first credit that they can spend, you know, 60 seconds doing really fast writes to disk if that's available on the disk before the uh, QoS kicks in. Well, Matt, um, John MacArthur here. I really appreciate you sharing your ex uh, your experiences in trying to quiet noisy neighbors on uh, shared infrastructure, converged infrastructure. Um, Again, our guest today was uh, Matt Wallace. He's Director of Cloud Architecture at ViaWest. Uh, Wikibon Peer Insight of December uh, 18th is, uh, is at a wrap. We'll post uh, our uh, comments, documents here in the next, uh, in the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. Please feel free to, to uh, jump on, edit, enhance, improve the, uh, the documents. Uh, our next uh, Peer Insight is January 22nd, where we'll be talking about achieving 10 exabyte scale. Uh, so I hope you can uh, join uh, uh, Dave Vellante for that, uh, for that pure insight. Thanks very much, uh, John MacArthur, Dave Vellante. Thank you, David Floyer on the phone for, uh, for your questions as well. And with that, it's a wrap. Thanks.